So, we will continue our discussion on angle modulation today and if you recollect we had uh, we had looked at the spectrum of an angle modulated signal when it is modulated by when the modulating signal is a pure sinusoidal signal right that was a point at which we uh, finished last time. So, let, let me recapitulate we wrote an expression for x of t which was your modulated signal in terms of a series expansion right. We showed that this kind of angle modulated signal which could have been either which could be either an FM signal or a phase modulated signal right. We could write this in terms of a series expansion in which the coefficients of the series are the Bessel functions right and the functions involved here are sinusoids of frequency omega c plus minus n omega m. So, that is a series expansion for the f m signal or the p m signal right and how did we arrive at this? We arrived at this by considering the Fourier series expansion of e to the power j beta sin omega m t and then considering the fact that the required signal is nothing but the real part of e to the power j omega c t into e to the power j beta sin omega m t right. So, we expanded e to the power j beta sin omega m t into its Fourier series and then took the real part of that and that is what you get right. Now, this is uh, the starting point for our discussion regarding <coughs> the spectrum of an FM signal. Of course, please remember that we are doing this spectrum discussion for the very special case when the modulating signal is a sinusoid not for the general modulating signal m of t right that is a much more difficult exercise right. So, what do we find first of all before we discuss any further the um, of course, this is obvious from this expression that we have a very large number of frequency components unlike the am case where the frequency components were omega c omega c plus omega m and omega c minus omega m we have a very large number of spectral components present here right and the behavior of the spectrum is dictated by the behavior of these coefficients which are Bessel function values right. So, to understand the spectrum better we need to understand a little bit about the nature of these Bessel functions. Now, this is not a course in mathematics so I will not really go into a mathematical discourse on Bessel functions. I will just give you a few salient properties of Bessel functions which are relevant to our discussion right? and I hope you learn it in more detail in maths if you have not already done so. So, let us review uh, some in useful facts about Bessel functions. First, there is a kind of symmetry uh, in these functions as a function of n, right. You can you, you go you, in the series expansion, you have n going from minus infinity to plus infinity, right. Now, uh, it can be shown that j n beta is equal to minus 1 to the power n into j n beta, j minus n beta. So, these are this is how the Bessel functions with uh, of order n and order n min minus n are related right. It, what this means is this is equal to j n beta or j minus n beta for n even and equal to uh, minus of j minus n beta for n odd right. So, alternative uh, 
coefficients on the positive and negative side are symmetrical but opposite in sign right. So, j 1 beta and j minus 1 beta have opposite signs, but j 2 beta and j minus 2 beta have the same sign right and so on and so forth. So, that is one in, in interesting property of these SL functions. The second one is and this uh, should be intuitively clear, but mathematically can be also proved that if you take the square of each of these functions and add it from minus infinity to plus infinity for any value of beta right this is equal to it cannot be 0 we are adding sum of squares this is equal to 1 it should be obvious now let us see why it should be obvious look at these two expressions if you look at the power in the signal what is the power here a square by 2 what is the power in the signal here it is a it will be the you know every sinusoid that you have in the signal has a power a square into j n square beta by 2 and obviously they two they represent the same signal. So, the total power must be the same right. So, it is obvious that this property this kind of property must be satisfied irrespective of the f m case of course under which we are discussing carrying out this discussion this can be shown purely as a property of the Bessel functions themselves. Of course, it is consistent with what we expect in our case okay. So, that is one. Thirdly for beta which is remember what is beta? Beta is this index here that is present in the modulated signal and we have defined beta to be the so called modulation <coughs> index for angle modulated signals right. Beta is equal to k p times a m for the case of phase modulation and k sub f times a m upon omega m for the case of frequency modulation right. But nevertheless it is a factor which has some very important relevance to the present discussion which will come to very, very soon and we call it the modulation index right. So, beta is a modulation index and when the modulation index is very small that is much less than 1 then the all the coefficients that we are referring to the Bessel functions that we are referring to have a small argument you are talking of j n beta j 0 beta j 1 beta etcetera with beta the argument being much less than 1 right. Under these conditions the term j 0 beta is the pre <coughs> predominant term it is a dominant term right. So, this dominates or predominates right what it means is uh, let me be more specific j 0 beta for beta very small is approximately 1 in fact j 0 0 is equal to 1 right. So, j 0 beta is approximately equal to 1 j 1 beta is approximately equal to beta by 2 and j n beta is approximately equal to 0 for n greater than 2 greater than or equal to 2 let us say. What does this mean that when your modulation index is small out of all this infinite number of terms that this expansion has only 3 terms will be the most significant one corresponding to n equal to 0 one corresponding to n equal to 1 and n equal to minus 1 right. That means the spectral components that you will see will be primarily the carrier frequency which is for n equal to 0 and omega c plus omega m and omega c minus omega m. Now which is very interesting because it is precisely these spectral components which are present in the am signal right. So, when the modulation index is very small the spectrum of the f m signal is very similar to that of an AM signal there are some important differences which will come to right. So, we call this kind of a uh, F m signal or P m signal as narrow band angle modulation anyway right now I am uh, not 
I am discussing only the Bessel function properties we will come, come back to this point separately again. So, these are things that you can prove that j 0 beta approximately is equal to 1 for beta very small beta much less than 1 j 1 beta is approximately equal to beta by 2 <coughs> and j n beta is 0 for n greater than or equal to 2. Lastly uh, or may not be maybe a couple of other properties are there this this is not of any immediate physical relevance, but one important interesting <coughs> mathematical property that Bessel functions satisfy is an iterative relationship that they have with respect to each other. Bessel functions of different orders satisfy a recursion right and that recursion is given by this. which essentially means that if I know j n beta and j n minus 1 beta for a given value of beta I can find out j n plus 1 beta right. So, there is a recursive relationship that is satisfied by the Bessel functions right. So, which, which is helpful in the computation of the Bessel functions right. Now, but still I think with the help of these properties you get some idea, but not a complete idea as to what the Bessel functions actually look like it will be interesting to also plot some of these functions that is j 0 beta, j 1 beta etcetera and see what they look like and that you will start feeling better about these functions. And if you have, have done that uh, for you here and this is what the plots look like. <coughs> I have plotted here j 0 beta as a function of beta right j 1 beta as a function of beta, j 3 beta as a function of beta right and similarly you can plot more right. So, this is so what do you see you see that these functions are oscillatory in nature right they are not monotonically increasing or decreasing they are oscillatory in nature right. Uh, it is not exactly an oscillation of constant amplitude, the amplitude decreases as beta increases right and as beta becomes very large they all become very small right. Second the property that we discussed j 0 j 0 beta is approximately 1 this point is 1 in the neighborhood of 0 right at 0 it is exactly equal to 1 right and all other functions start from 0 right they are 0 at beta equal to 0 and they are very small as you can see j 1 beta approximately increases linearly at this point whereas this is not even linearly increasing this is more or less 0 for quite some um, fraction of value of beta right. So, all the properties that I just mentioned to you can be seen to be true here <coughs> right and because this functions are oscillatory in nature the spectrum varies a lot right. For example, let us look at this is for a small value of beta the carrier component is the largest right and there is of course, the first sideband components that is the uh, omega 0 plus minus omega m components right. But suppose the modulation index is somewhere here that is beta is equal to 2.4 or something right. For this value what happens to j 0 beta it becomes 0 right. So, for a particular modulation index like beta is equal to about 2.4 the carrier component becomes 0 right j 0 beta is the coefficient of the carrier component right. Remember this uh, expression that we had. Look at this expression. When n is equal to zero, you get the carrier component. So j zero beta is the coefficient of the carrier component. This becomes zero whenever beta takes a value such that this becomes zero here, right? Or for example, beta is equal to five point something here, right? So, so for these values. 
the carrier component disappears and you have all the energy present in the side bands only right whereas for large values of beta energy is equally distributed in the various side bands and a very large number of side bands right because they all decrease so that's the so i hope with this picture you have a better feel for the bessel function what do they look like as a function of beta and if you were to use this in association with our discussion earlier a typical spectral plot of an fm signal would therefore look like this right I have this is the frequency axis where i have chosen the frequency axis to be a normalized one i have looked at the frequency deviation from the center frequency fc normalized with respect to the modulating signal frequency f sub m right so when i say this point being zero that means f is equal to fc here right <coughs> so here the for this point we are looking at the spectral component at the point where the deviation is fm f minus fc is equal to fm right so basically this component denotes fc plus fm and this component denotes fc minus fm i have written 0 and minus 0 1 and minus 1 here but remember that the center frequency actually denotes the frequency the point 0 denotes the frequency f sub c right because i have normalized it by subtracting it from, from fc uh, subtracting the value of f fc from f okay and then so this denotes the component at the carrier frequency this denotes the component at fc plus fm this denotes the component at fc plus f, uh, 2 fm fc plus 3 fm and so on and so forth similarly these are the components at fc minus fm fc minus 2 fm and so on and so forth right so this is what a typical plot might look like so as you can see j1 beta and j uh, my j minus 1 beta are uh, have opposite signs but j2 beta and j they have the same sign j minus 2 beta and j2 beta have the same sign similarly for j3 beta and minus j3 beta they have i mean j minus 3 beta has opposite sign of j3 beta right and so on and so forth. so you see a very large number of spectral components present a wide band signal so in general when beta is not small right it is a wide we call it wide band angle modulation right so this becomes wide band angle modulation so although you had your modulating signal contain only a single frequency component f sub m your modulated signal contains has a very large bandwidth right any questions so far so i think with this discussion a you should be reasonably clear about what bessel functions are like and some of their important properties and b a typical spectral plot of you you appreciate now what is a typical spectral plot of an angle modulated signal right unlike only the three lines three line spectra that an am signal has corresponding to this situation the fm or pm signal will have a large number of lines corresponding to just the presence of a single frequency modulating signal at the input right so that's the important point any questions before i proceed further no good let's proceed further then so these are some of the important properties of bessel functions and this is what they look like <coughs> based on this let me summarize what are the important spectral properties we can derive so the spectral properties which are implied by these properties of the bessel functions are as follows so first point we see that the spectrum contains the carrier in general plus an infinite number of side bands 
right not just two side bands like we had earlier both on the positive side as well as on the negative side with respect to fc then by infinite number of side bands i mean frequency components like fc plus minus n fm unlike for the case of am where we had only fc plus minus fm second relative amplitudes and number of significant side bands number of significant spectral components what will they depend on hmm? would depend on the value of beta the modulation index like we saw for a small modulation index carrier has the largest component other components are much smaller but as beta increases there can be some values of beta where the carrier component is zero and all energy is contained in the side bands so which component has how much amplitude relative to each other will be decided by the value of the modulation index right so it depends on beta thirdly we have seen that for beta much less than 1 only the first two terms are significant or three terms j0 and j1 are significant <coughs> and the spectrum is similar to that of m while it is similar it is also slightly different in what way it is different that is right the two side bands are uh, a phase reverse with respect to each other there is the negative sign of one with respect to the other right f c plus f m has some amplitude and f c minus f m has a negative amplitude which means it is phase shifted by 180 degree right. So, except for the phase reversal of the lower side band component. right and this is called narrow band fm so narrow band fm which is the fm defined to arise when beta is very small has a spectrum similar to that of an am signal right in the sense that it has only the same two side bands fc plus minus fm with this difference as against this when beta is large let's say very large the number of significant spectral components is very large right and such a signal is said to be wide band fm or wide band pm it could be narrow band pm and wide band right so large bandwidth this implies large bandwidth but these descriptions of bandwidth are qualitative right small or large is qualitative a natural question arises can we convert this into a quantitative value can we say this is the bandwidth right now that's that's a slightly tricky situation here why because theoretically no matter what the value of beta may be whether it is small or large theoretically how many components are present in that series expansion infinite. So, theoretically the bandwidth is or quantitatively the bandwidth is always infinity right. But for all practical purposes because we have seen the nature of those functions these functions keep on decaying as uh, uh, beta tends to 0. Similarly, if you look at the value of the functions for different values of n right I have not got a plot here against n, but you, you can see the trend here 
you can see J0 beta starts with the largest amplitude right J1 beta has a smaller amplitude J3 has an even smaller amplitude and so on and so forth similarly the other functions will also be much smaller amplitudes each right. So you will also find that for larger and larger values of n the corresponding coefficients become smaller and smaller right. So um, therefore it, is, it can be expected that beyond a certain value the amplitudes of the spectral components and therefore the energy contained in these spectral components would be small and therefore they would not contribute significantly to the total energy of the signal right. So based on this fact we, we need to define bandwidth in a particular way and then come up with a quantitative figure for the expression for the bandwidth right. So let us do some uh, <coughs> discussion on that right. So we like to look at the bandwidth of angle modulated signals more quantitatively now rather than only calling it large or small. So as I said strictly speaking the bandwidth is infinity. But we I just said that in practice we make use of this fact that limit of J and beta as n becomes large right this tends to 0. This is again a property of the Bessel functions which I perhaps should have mentioned when I made the list of these properties. The J and beta as n tends to infinity that is Bessel function of infinite order identically is 0 right. So how do we define the bandwidth to define the bandwidth let me first define uh, a ratio E sub r which I will call the power ratio in this manner suppose I consider k side bands on either side of f sub c right and look at the energy contained in these 2k plus 1 components right from fc minus km K, kfm to fc plus kf look at the energy in this part of the signal this is approximating the actual signal right and take the ratio of this energy with the total energy of the signal right so that i'm calling uh, either energy ratio or the power ratio depending actually power ratio is a more appropriate term so what will be the and power containing the uh, 2k plus 1 components that I just mentioned it will be half AC square sigma j n square beta n going from minus k to plus k right and the total power is half AC square right. So as you can see this you can write as j0 square beta plus twice of j n square beta beta going from uh, n going from minus k sorry n going from 0 to k because I have taken twice of this number of terms I am sorry this should be 1 to k because 0 I have taken out thank you. So now the way we define the bandwidth is as follows we say we agree that uh, for a signal to have this bandwidth whatever we define the bandwidth to be it should have most of its energy in that band right only thing we need to now quantify is what is the definition of most right. So we can take some arbitrary figure and a generally accepted figure is 98 percent bandwidth right. So the way we define 98 percent bandwidth of, of any signal is uh, particularly signals which otherwise have infinite bandwidth right is <coughs> that band uh, those band of frequencies over which the signal contains 98 percent of its power that means the value of this power ratio is 
0.98 okay. So, basically what we need to figure out is for what value of k this turns out to be about 0.98 right because this ratio can at most be 1. So, the value of k for which this becomes about 0.98 would be the 98 percent bandwidth of the signal right. So, for a given application bandwidth is defined for a specific <coughs> value of P r right and for whatever value that you select the bandwidth will then become 2 k times f sub m right. Whatever value of k would give you that value of P r would then uh, imply that the bandwidth is 2 k f. So, for P r to be greater than or equal to 0 0.98 that is the 98 percent bandwidth. Now, if you look at the table of vessel functions a very interesting fact comes to light right that if you choose P r to be greater than 0 0.98 the value of k that you need so that so that this becomes 0 0.98 depends on the value of beta right. And but there is a very nice closed form of course, it is not closed form in the in mathematical sense it is an empirical sense empirically it is found that for a given value of beta if you choose k to be uh, equal to 2 beta plus uh, sorry beta plus 1 just 1 more than the value of the modulation index right. That value of k would lead to this being 0.98 or larger right. So, this is something that you look at uh, empirically from the table of Bessel functions. I cannot prove it mathematically here for you, maybe it can be even proved, but I think we will just take it as that. So, for P r greater than 0 0.98, it is noted that k can be taken as an integer part of beta plus 1. Okay. So, this is an empirical result by looking at the nature of the Bessel functions right and therefore, that tells us quantitatively the value of the 98 percent bandwidth. <coughs> so, this implies that the bandwidth is twice into beta plus 1 times f m right because the bandwidth is 2 k f m right and that is the expression for bandwidth of an FM signal approximately. So, as you can see there is a very simple closed form result here, but this simple closed form result is for the special case when the modulating signal is a pure sine wave right. This result is valid only for that special case. Any questions? Can you give a physical let us give another meaning to this formula. Uh, can you interpret <coughs> what beta f m is if you look at the expression for uh, the f m or m p m signal that you have can you give some physical meaning to the term beta times f m. Let us go back to this expression. Yes, let us look at this expression. This is the expression for the p m signal right. Can you give some physical meaning to the term beta times f m <coughs> or beta times omega m? How will it arise? If I differentiate the argument right and what does the differentiate differentiated argument give me? Frequency. The instantaneous frequency right. So, if I differentiate what do I get? Omega c plus beta omega m sin omega m t right. Now, can you give me a physical meaning? Maximum value that the 
signal will have a frequency deviation right because the frequency deviation expression becomes beta times omega m into cosine omega mt maximum value of cosine omega mt is 1 right. So, the maximum value of the frequency deviation would be beta times omega m right. So, beta times f m is nothing but the maximum or the peak value of the frequency deviation that this signal will exhibit. You want to understand the definition of frequency deviation right with respect to the center frequency. The instantaneous frequency of both your AM, uh, FM signal and PM signal keep on varying, keep on varying or fluctuating about the mean value which is the carrier frequency value right. At different times you have different instantaneous frequencies right. <coughs> Remember the plots that we made for the FM signal at, at some points along the axis time axis the signal was highly compressed where the instantaneous frequency was large and at some other points the signal was uh, much more sparse and there, there the instantaneous frequency was smaller than omega c. The peak value of the frequency instantaneous frequency deviation is equal to beta times FM right. So, please remember that. So, therefore, you can also write this formula in a different way namely twice beta times f m is let me call this delta f plus f m where delta f is defined as beta times f m and can be interpreted to be the peak value of the frequency deviation peak frequency deviation. or maximum frequency deviation now this analysis that we have just done is valid only for sinusoidal sig modulating signals for more general signals it's approximately possible to argue out the bandwidth of the fm signal right <coughs> we'll not go through that argument for because it's beyond our, the scope of our course here but I will just give you the result. So, we are looking now at the result for a general modulating signal MT when MT is not cosine 2 pi FMT right. What can we say about the bandwidth of the FM signal and I am only giving you the result we are not going through any, dis any uh, discussion for this. To do that let me define D as the following ratio peak frequency deviation upon bandwidth of M T because M T now is a general signal it is not a sinusoidal signal the only way you can characterize it is through its bandwidth right. So, let me call this as delta f upon w delta f is a peak frequency deviation of the f m signal or the p m signal w is the bandwidth of the message signal M T right then it can be shown that approximately the 98 percent bandwidth of this signal or the uh, FM signal or the PM signal is now given by 2 into D plus 1 times W very similar to the formula that we had just a few minutes ago which was 2 into beta plus 1 times FM and here also you can write this as delta f is not it d into w is delta f plus w and here also you can write it as 2 delta f plus f sub m right. This is what we derived this is a generaliz generalization of this two arbitrary signals it is very similar right. These formulas for the bandwidth were given by a gentleman called Carson and therefore, these are known as Carson's formulas for the bandwidth of an FM signal. Any questions? <coughs> Now, 
again in these general cases also you can see that the whether you will have narrow band FM or wide band FM will really depend on the value of delta F that is another way of looking at it is when beta is large delta F is large right and you have wide band FM right. So, the important point is when delta F is large the band will be governed <coughs> largely by the peak frequency deviation and that makes a lot of intuitive sense if you think about it right. What you are saying is the bandwidth will be essentially dictated by what is the highest instantaneous frequency in the signal is it clear. On the other hand when delta f is small which is essentially will happen when beta is small when the modulation index is small the bandwidth will be dictated by the highest frequency component present in the modulating signal right because then it is like an am signal is that clear the signal uh, is not like an am signal i am sorry i should have, i should not have said that the signal is very different from that of an am signal for example the am signal has amplitude variations this signal will never have amplitude variations right but when beta is small its spectrum looks like that of an am signal okay so um, that's essentially a very brief idea about what the spectrum of an fm signal is like any questions you can take it uh, just a minute if you have any questions and uh, absorb everything that uh, we have discussed <coughs> hmm? frequency uh, frequency sensitive uh, application like if we want a small frequency also <coughs> mm, I am not clear about your question his question is is this method uh, suitable for frequency sensitive applications you, your, your question should I rephrase it as should FM or PM be used in frequency sensitive applications. Mm, I do not know what that question means, so I cannot really answer it. Hmm? So Maybe which can vary with instant of time. So, what it exactly means to say is if it is frequency sensitive, then I will have a disturbance because I cannot exactly tell what the frequency is at point of time. You see, if you are if you are referring to the process of modulation and demodulation. <coughs> the value of the modulation index in some sense reflects that sensitivity that you are referring to, but the sensitivity is with respect to the amplitude of the modulating signal please remember that our purpose is fully satisfied if our modulation is sensitive to the <coughs> amplitude of the modulating signal instantaneous <coughs> amplitude and that is what we are doing in FMRPM we are making the instantaneous phase or instantaneous frequency depend on the instantaneous amplitude of the modeling signal. So, if we have right now we are only looking at the spectral properties right we need to look at the demodulation uh, of these signals uh, so that we can see whether or not we will be able to recover those signals properly our concern should be with respect uh, with, the, with the recovery of these signals right and the recovery process will depend on how you demodulate right. So, I think your question therefore is not relevant to the discussion that we have now, right now, but we are going to come to generation and demodulation of FM signals. So, when we are using Bessel's, Bessel functions right. so to analyze the signal, so this is only valid when uh, the signal MT is a cost of signal. That is right. So, we cannot use this for a general signal. That is right. right. I mean we did not use Bessel functions <laughs> deliberately, they arose. <laughs> We did a uh, Fourier series expansion of uh, e to the power j beta sin omega mt and the Fourier coefficients turned out to be j and betas. And sir, these Bessel signals are uh, only in integers, right? It has to be an integer. No, Bessel functions can be defined for uh, other values of n also, which are non integer values, but we do not need them here. For our discussion, we do not need them here, right? There are various kinds of Bessel functions, 
this is only one kind, right? Okay. The various kinds of vessel functions. So, uh, I think for that I would like you to uh, refer to a book on mathematics, right? Okay, then let us proceed further. If there are no more questions, <coughs> next thing what we would like to take up is how do we generate and how do we demodulate angle modulated signal? Obviously, that is the next thing that we need to discuss. So, generation. Demodulation. Now, primarily there are two. Let's first look look at the generation issue. Generation. Right. You can classify the various possible methods into two broad categories the direct methods and the indirect methods, right. The direct method actually uses a device. What do we want? How, how can we generate an FM signal? Just think about it. How do we generate a sinusoidal carrier? What do we need for that? an oscillator of suitable frequency right. Now what do we want? We want the frequency of this oscillator to depend on the amplitude of another signal right. So we need to modify this oscillator if we can such that the instantaneous frequency of this oscillator can be made to depend on a voltage somewhere right and it is fortunately possible to design such circuits right. And when you have been able to design such a circuit, we call it a voltage controlled oscillator, right. So, the direct method basically depends on the design and construction of what are called voltage controlled oscillators. Are in short known as VCOs, okay. Now, uh, you have voltage control oscillators of different kinds which have been designed and fabricated. Now, depending on uh, what frequency range you are working with, you will have different kinds of designs, right. You can have a voltage control oscillator based on uh, LC components, right. You can have voltage control oscillators based on uh, RC components, which are called relaxation oscillators, right. Now, I do not know whether you have come across uh, S stable multi vibrators in your either digital or analog, analog electronics. <coughs> if you come across S stable multi vibrators, they are nothing but voltage control oscillators, right. Um, if you are working with microwave frequencies, there are special devices like klystron, right, which can be used as volt voltage control oscillators and so on and so forth, right. Now, since therefore it depends on uh, what frequency you are working with you have different kinds of devices right. I will not go into a very detailed discussion of the design of the voltage control oscillators except to say that it is possible to design circuits, devices, systems which can be essentially voltage control oscillators. And once I have such a voltage control oscillator to the control input basically what does it mean that you have an oscillator right. I mean if you look at it purely from a block diagrammatic point of, point of view, an oscillator normally there is no input except the power supply right and it produces an output oscillated uh, oscillation signal right. Here you have a control voltage right and the frequency of this will depend on the voltage applied here. So, if I apply to this at the control voltage terminal the modulating signal right the output oscillations will depend on the input amplitude right that is what these devices do. As to how they are designed would be the subject of uh, would be the topics of subjects that you are doing otherwise right other subjects that you are studying or will study. So, we will not go into those we will assume that such things are possible to make maybe we will discuss one such example slightly later. 
okay this is for what kind of uh, what kind of oscillations will what kind of system will this be frequency modulated signal or or pm uh, phase modulated signal if i use a voltage control oscillator uh, this will give me fm or pm frequency modulation can i use it for generating pm just think about it hmm? here is a message signal empty good very good he has suggested the answer so if i apply mt to a vco i'll get an fm signal right this is what you are saying right if i apply mt but first differentiate it right and then apply to a vco i'll get a pm signal you remember why okay so i don't have to repeat it but just to complete the discussion remember that the instantaneous frequency of a pm signal would be proportional to the derivative of the message signal isn't it it's obvious because instantaneous phase deviation is proportional to the message signal mt so the instantaneous frequency deviation will depend on the derivative of the message signal because instantaneous frequency is derivative of the instantaneous phase right so this is how it comes so if i feed mt directly to vco i get fm if i feed a differentiated version of mt to the vco i get the pm signal right actually we'll discuss later for various reasons what we call fm transmission is neither pure fm nor pure pm it's something in between right what that means is something that we'll discuss later so i'll stop here for the moment and next next time we'll discuss the indirect methods Thank you very much.